Uh, kia ora everyone. Yeah, so I'm I'm Brian Tweed. I am currently um, a senior lecturer in the Institute of Education at Massey University here in Palmerston North, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Um, uh, yes, so I was, I was going to do this in my presentation, but I'll do it now anyway. Um, yeah, so so you probably tell from my accent that I'm originally from the UK, uh, born in a little town called Atherston in the Midlands. And uh, I came to New Zealand in 1987. So I've been here quite a while, more than half my life. And in that time, um, I've... Um, been drawn to Tao Māori, the sort of indigenous world here in, in Aotearoa. So I'm a fluent speaker of Te Reo Māori. Uh, my wife and children are Māori. And um, that's my, my major focus, uh, research focus, is uh, this peculiar thing that we have going on here uh, between descendants of settlers and indigenous Māori in education, but throughout our society. And the peculiar interactions that happen and struggles that happen between those two, let's say, two worlds. Um, so uh, what else can I say? E that'll do for now. <laughs> when I think of other things, I'll say them. Um, I killed everyone. So is so we shall we out wait for us. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? Talk about themselves? No, you go for it, Brian. Do you need hey? to share your screen or anything? Oh yes, I do. Yes. Shall I just launch into things? Yeah, go for it. All right. Jump in. All right. Um, just before I do that, I just want to say, you know, echo what Carl said about um, you know, joining in because actually I really need you to join in and help me out with this. Um so this is a sort of work in progress. It's something I've been trying to do uh, since before COVID happened. Uh, that sort of messed things up quite a bit. And I'm sort of, I keep sort of chipping away at it, trying to make sense of things. And I know that I'm, some of the, some of the, there's some rough edges in all of this. And I would love it if you help me smooth them off. So um, I'm actually really glad we've got a small group. Um, so that's awesome. Let me just find my presentation. There it is. Can everyone see that? Yes, yeah. Good, good. Um, yes. Um, so I don't know if this title matches with the one that was advertised. I think it's more or less that. Um, and I've I've deliberately put that you know the you see my name there and the two two sides to the naming that's going on um, the Kurota Ma Tauranga Institute of Education Kuninga Kipule Hurua and so on and it's sort of a bit emblematic of where we are in uh, Aotearoa New Zealand in terms of striving to be a sort of bicultural nation and that's a bit of a sort of uh, theme that's going to run through everything. Um, uh, already said that actually. So I'm just this, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, uh, I'm not presenting. You'll see from my presentation that it's not it's not slick. It's, uh, there's probably some typos and a few other errors in it. Um, feel free to point them out. Um, still in. Can I just say, Brian, don't worry about that. This is great because, like, yeah. one of the things that I'm always trying to say to people when I'm asking people if they want to do something for the round table is you don't have to have like a fully developed, having given it already talk. You know, it's like one of the things that's great is to do work in progress and see all those rough edges and things that aren't sorted out and so on. Yes. Like, we never get to see one of the things that we never get to see and learn about is the process of research and work that isn't all slickly finished. Yes. Oh, well, that's good then. I won't disappoint you on that one. Um, yes, but uh, so I'm hoping for input from everybody, some questions and suggestions about making things better. And uh, 
and so on. Um, but at the end of it, I, I think I might have something constructive or transformative to say. So let's get on with it. Um, just a little bit about, I don't expect you to read that, but I just put it. So, so that's the other thing about my presentations. They're really for me to remind me about what to say. Um, so where I'm coming from, as you know, remembering what I said earlier, it won't, won't surprise you, is very much in this um, uh, idea of Māori, Indigenous people everywhere, but in my context, Māori, having a right to be Māori uh, in every in 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 the full sense of that word. Uh, that's backed up by the Universal Declaration of uh, the Rights of Indigenous People. And we have this thing called the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, uh, which was in a written in Te Reo Māori, Māori language and English, and the two are quite different. Um, so I go on the Māori version, which basically says, yes, Māori have a right to keep everything that they own and be self-determining in every in every way. Um, just a little bit of thinking that I've done about decolonization, uh, indigenization, and the sort of term that I'm going to be using myself that I've started to use myself is this term repowering. Um, I have a little bit of a sort of difficulty with decolonizing because it's, to me anyway, it seems to be about sort of some sort of weeding. You're going to weed out the colonizing bits or you're sort of going to negate the colonizing, a sort of negation of the negative going on there. Got a similar sort of feeling. Penny, you've got a question. Oh, just to support your feelings, Brian, about decolonization, um, my... Hi, hi. Um, my uh, close colleague, who is an in, uh, first Pe First Nations people in Australia, much prefers an at least an ing version of decolonizing because yes. she says, you know, yeah, it's yes. certainly certainly an ongoing process. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, that makes me happy because I've got repowering. It's an ing there. Yes. Awesome. Um, so indigenization. Is sort of sort of problematical in the sense of like, does it mean replacing something with an indigenous version or replacing something with something that is indigenous? Well, what does that mean? What is indigenous? Um, um, and so I've sort of settled on this this idea of repowering, which um, comes from one of our komata, one of our elders, um, Wana Jackson, who passed away last year, unfortunately. Um, and it simply states, he simply states it as reclaiming the right of Indigenous peoples to once again govern themselves in their own lands. And what interests me about that is it makes no claims about what should be dispensed with or what should be included. And uh, that's, that's something, that's one of the reasons I like it. Um, okay, next. And the, this, this, the, there's a sort of reference for that in the, at the bottom of the page. Um, repowering, yes. And so just, just to sort of bring us into the sort of LCT space, um, so repowering for me in respect to sort of specialization and autonomy, which are sort of going to be circulating around in this talk, um, is that Māori have the right to operate with their own categories of knowledge um, and the ways that they interrelate them and to organise knowledge according to their own understandings of what a person is and how people are connected. And that is informed from my PhD and my, and my sort of life experience where um, in, my, in my understandings, um, and in LCT terms, um, Indigenous education and Indigenous uh, practices and social contexts generally are NOAA codes in the sense of, of, of central importance is your own genealogy, your own 
fuck up, papa. Your own connection into a sort of constellation of people connected through kinship. And that knowledge becomes organized within that constellation of people. And uh, so repowering means, yep, Māori can do that. And that's that's my commitment. Uh, who am I? I've said a little bit about about myself, so I won't I won't I'll just skip over that one. Um, so something else that's sort of floating around in here is this idea of uh, this thing called neoliberalism, and um, there's a lot. Of course, I, there's a lot to be said about neoliberalism. I don't think it's any surprise to anyone to say that. Uh, I'm guessing for most people here that universities are neoliberal institutions, um, certainly in New Zealand, um, which seemed to be remarkably keen to neoliberalize itself in the 80s and 90s, so much so that uh, very few people here, certainly, of course, under the age of 40 or so, even know that there's any alternative to neoliberalism. Um, but the, 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 there's such a lot to, to be said about, you know, the sort of deleterious effects, in my view, of neoliberalism in education. Um, but I'm just going to focus on this aspect of it, um, in which the market is positioned as some kind of epistemological tool. So it's all good if you can survive in the market. Otherwise, you don't really exist. Um, so just going to bracket that one and bring it back in later. Um, okay, I uh, just want to acknowledge this book. This is a great book that um, is part of the LCT series. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the authors for producing this book. It has, you know, I've, I've read it several times and it's been uh, quite inspiring and has a lot of sort of resonances with my own work. So that's a cool book. Um, oh, here's a little quote from it, which I like and is relevant to this uh, this talk. Um, without addressing the curriculum question, decolonization remains at the symbolic level. And I certainly see that a lot in schools and universities here where, uh, you know, you walk around campus and you might see many uh, sort of Māori carvings and, you know, iconography around the place. And then you walk into the building and it's... Uh, the same vanilla beige uh, thing that is everywhere. Um, so again, just an acknowledgement to those authors. Um, I'll just I, I won't read through all of that, but this this little piece here, which I managed to access through that through that book, um, Aslam Fatah which again in the South African context is sort of chiming in, resonating with my own sort of contentions that neoliberalism actually is, is the biggest challenge that indigenous people, that indigenous um, emancipatory actions or projects face. And that's because in my view, the neoliberal sort of discourse has masked or taken on or reclothed a sort of racist discourse that's inherited from colonization, and that's pretty much what's being said there. Um, so, um, being Māori is a difficult thing. You have to contend with what it is to be Māori yourself, which after 200 years of colonization is not easy to figure out what, it, what that means. But there's also neoliberalism, there's also Western pedagogical practices, which I think we'll, we'll get a glimpse of that today. Um, and also what I would, what I consider to be a sort of inherited dominant mainstream sort of colonial, settler colonial discourse, which actually is still quite alive and well uh, in New Zealand and I'm guessing elsewhere. So I'm just putting that sort of picture there just to say, well, it's tough. This is a tough thing. Being Māori is tough. Brian? 
Um, it's, it's okay, down here. to this. Yes. Can I? Hey, can, 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 yeah, for, I, I'm from I'm from South Africa. Yes. Yes, um, I've read some of your work. You uh, okay, thanks. Can you go to the previous slide? Absolutely. So this is so interesting for me because. Um, you know, obviously we're dealing, we're grappling with the same kind of issues in South Africa, but we really yeah. had have a perception from 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 here that um, New Zealand is like the absolute model of where um, indigenous culture was ex accepted. Um, given equal status, embraced, um, and, you, you know, so we're trying to really um, dig down into our prejudices and learned racist behavior and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but we actually, certainly me, I don't know what the other South Africans here have said, but like, for example, um, Botswana, where there was a early agreement straight away that recognized indigenous rights and they were part, the, 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 um, the Botswana was, were part of the whole, um, you know, building up the, the post-colonial thing, you know, years and years and years ago, very, very early on, but we thought that uh, New Zealand had been the same. So, so you know, this this is quite a, a a surprise to me that that perhaps you, you know our 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 perception of of that kind of history being dealt with long long time ago is still perpetuating even in the New Zealand context. Yes. Yes. Thanks for that, Lee. Yes, and. Um... The first, the first thing that comes to my mind is that this strikes me as one of the myths that are pro is propagated about New Zealand. It's a, you know a bit like the, um, you know, New Zealand, the the, the clean, you know, one hundred percent pure, clean, clean, green New Zealand. Mm. Well, that's just not true. Uh, for example, a few years ago, there was a big um, push in New Zealand to. Um, Make it so that our rivers and streams, you could you could swim in them. You can't. Uh, the government at the time committed to making them wadeable. Um, and I think you know this 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 sort of myth about New Zealand be having, you know, as a place of racial harmony, is a similar myth. And. Uh, I would like to draw a line to neoliberalism and say, well, you know, I think, and, and capitalism, of course, but I think, you know, Māori, Māori stuff's all good as long as it doesn't affect the bottom line. Ah. Uh, so. That's really interesting, but thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. I've learned something. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I've got a, you know, my, my default position is sort of, you know, troll, but I try to be a bit more positive. I mean, that's not to say that, you know, there's a lot of good things. Like, for example, um, and I, you know, I think that this is where the impression that things are going well here comes from. So, for example, we actually have a complete education system from early childhood right through to doctorate level, where students can, at every stage, uh, progress and achieve entirely in Te Reo Māori in the Māori language. In certain, so at doctoral level, that's in certain areas. It's not every, everything, and that's certainly to be celebrated. And um, generally speaking, there is amongst the non-Maori population a a quite a positive um, approach, quite a positive uh, attitude towards Maori, and an acceptance of the treaty. You know, a treaty of Waitangi having been breached for pretty much ever, and Māori having a pretty bad time, you know, confiscation of lands and other worse things happening. Mm. So that we, um, you know, just, so I'm, I'm not saying that we, you know, there's a lot of good things happening here, but we're far from perfect. I mean, that's 
That's for sure. Thanks. Um, yes, yes, okay, this is what I did. This is what I'm still doing and have done for the on and off for a few years now is look into look at courses in BA courses um, at my own university and other universities uh, and look into at this stage I'm looking at I have looked at specialization and autonomy in like within you know, my unit of analysis if you like is the course which is here is a one semester usually 12 weeks 12 weeks long um, so I've um, another another thing about universities here. Uh, so they have very strong sort of digital versions of their courses. So most courses are actually designed. Um, uh, their digital version is designed, and then any face to face happens off that. So usually it's a sort of blended um, a blended form, a blended sort of delivery, if you like. And this is quite cool from a research point of view because you know the resources are right there. You just log on to the course, get permission to log on the course and and have a look at the resources. Um, so that's what I did, and I started to investigate specialization autonomy, and I'm going to mostly concentrate on uh, the autonomy uh, codes um, that, that uh, in one particular course, I'm just going to focus on one course. Um, um, uh, so far, I've, sort of, I've uh, sort of investigated about eight courses uh, at three different universities. Um, but of course, my, uh, it's it's much e it's, it's, it's easier to do them at my own. So most of them are from there, from here. Um, okay. Uh, yes. So. You know, echoing that, you know, the sort of bicultural sort of naming of things, it seems that, you know, biculturalism is our theme. And so there's, the, so BA, the, most courses, but the BA courses in particular tend to have sort of mainstream sections and a Māori section. There's usually, say, in a 12-week course, there might be, there could be, say, 12 sections, 12 units of work, one each week, and there'll be one that's a Māori section and 11 that are, I'm going to use the term mainstream, but I know there are problems with that, but uh, I'll just carry on anyway. Um, and so my interest in this was 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 sort of peaked and sort of taken by this, the possibility of having different uh, specialization autonomy codes in the different, uh, those different sections of the course and what, if anything, that meant for students. Um, and staff. By the way, Brian. Yes. We uh, we now have someone from another um, uh, person from um, uh, New Zealand here. Uh, Jay. Hello. How Kilda. Yes, Brian and I know each other. <laughs> hey. Kilda. Yeah, hold on. Oh, are we? <laughs> Indeed. Oh, no, that's awesome, Jay. Yeah, Tenahui. Uh, yes. Now, okay. Yeah, so that's it. Um, so what did? So I'll just. I'm just going to actually just very quick, very quickly, uh, sort of, uh, just report the uh, penny. Go on. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just to ask, who were the authors that of of these different sections? Uh, so, um, so the. Uh, so let's so like I'll just talk about the course that I'm going to focus on, and um, so there's a there's a course coordinator who is uh, was a colleague at the time of the course I'm talking about, and uh, that that person wrote all of the mainstreams, created all of the mainstream sections, and the Māori section was actually put together by. Uh, two Māori colleagues, and one of them sort of delivered a lecture in there. So it wasn't the case that a sort of non-Māori person sort of created the Māori section, if that's... And, oh, and that's that's something that just you know, I perhaps should have said earlier about myself. I, I mean, it's I think it's sort of clear anyway, but... Um, 
yes, quite quite often I get challenged as someone who's not Māori, um, sort of researching in Māori contexts, and um, that's in some case, you know, that's I welcome that challenge, and it's it's right that the challenge is made, and um, so I usually respond to that challenge by pointing out who I am and my connect my own connections, my own Māori family, for example, and uh, my own sort of uh, cultural sort of competences as well. And usually that's enough, not always. Um, but so far... Um, so, um, so, so there you go. You just um, uh, gave an example of uh, what a code clash this looks like, right? Whether yes, tell me more. Tell asking... me more. Exactly. So whether only people of specific backgrounds could do that kind of research, yeah. right? Whether yeah. you have yeah. to have these strong subjective relations. Yes. Whereas you are you're arguing for also kind of nowhere code, right? As well, or or uh, if if it's a sorry, knowledge code, but if it's a knower code, right, you're also arguing for other kinds of relations, right, that being yes. immersed in yeah. that culture and yeah, so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I mean, that's 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 a great uh, question. So, sorry, what's your name? I can't tell from how it's written in it there. My name is Pavel. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'll read it. Pavel. So, my name is Pavel. Pavel Tenakwe, yeah. Um, Yes, and that's that's this is something that I came across in in my PhD studies because, you know, I, um, that was based in a a Maldi uh, secondary school, and um, in order to do to be able to do that research, um, I, I I needed to have a specific kind of relationship with not not just people in the school but the all of the families associated with the school and the sort of sub-tribe associated with that school. Um, now, fortunately, I was, of course, I, I was able to do it. I, I didn't just sort of turn up one day and knock on the, knock on the door and say, can I do this research in your school? I'd already had a relationship with the school for about 10 years earlier. So, it was the relationship I already had that allowed me to do the research. Um, but the reason the reason they accepted me, it, 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 um, you know, I agree. It's it's you know, in, in LCT terms, it's a NOAA code. But it's interesting, and I think this this is a bit of a thing. This is a bit of a part. This is something to do with Maori culture. Is that you can be a legitimate NOAA if you possess uh, sufficient sort of cultural linguistic knowledge and show certain, <laughs> certain other sort of attributes that are valued to Māori. And it seems that I, at that time at least, was, a, was accepted on that basis. Um, but that's, you know, that's, an, that's a really, so, Whilst, whilst I would say, you know, in the you know, Māori context are NOAA codes, it's not exclusively about having a sort of genetic, a Māori genetic inheritance. It's not exclusively that there are other ways in which you can be a legitimate NOAA in a Māori context. I mean, I suppose um, that's the... The, the cold clash here is I mean, they might be worried that you would misrepresent them by yes. not being Maori and then kind of detract yes. from the, the decolonization or empowering that you kind yes. of move them move them backwards rather than help yes. them. Right? Yes. 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 And I, and I mean there's you know, it's, to be fair, Maori are quite um quite skeptical about research and have not have not got a good history of you know, the you know the re history of research on Maori is not is not a good story and so yes there is uh, there is much to be said about that 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 topic penny you've got a your hand up again Kia ora. you haven't oh okay Kawai. um 
Can I just add, by the way, that you've just yes. given a really nice example of this. Sometimes we, uh, we tend to think like knowledge code equals standpoint theory, and it doesn't. It's not the only kind of NOAA code out there. So sometimes you get this sort of, um, this kind of rather, I mean, LCT people don't tend to do this, but more widely you can get this rather um, simplistic equation of uh, NOAA code equals standpoint theory. Um, and that's the only type, forgetting, for example, you know, the fact that, you know, most of the humanities operate on NOAA codes, large parts of sociology does, large parts of uh, social psychology does, uh, but they're not all, you know, who you are as a, as a strongly bounded social category that can only occur through who you were born to and where you yes. were born and that sort of stuff that you can actually become part of. Even a, even a social NOAA code like that, you can still become part of a group through other means sometimes so like you know through for example knowledge or or some kind of um long-term engagement or something like that so it's really valuable to remember that the lct planes are an infinite number of positions they're not like just everything in a box is all the same thing i think you've just yeah. given a great example of how that the, the sort of noah code you're being asked about is like is not necessarily just uh, sorry you Carl, are this I... <clears throat> I, I don't want to hijack this presentation just to talk about theory, but I thought that that a social NOAA code means that you should be, say, part of that group by being in that social strata. In this case, in this case, I'm having been born Maori, whereas if you say your family are Maori, so in the case of today's speaker, it's wife and children. You were exposed to that culture. You live in that culture. Then it's more like interactional relations are strong, but social relations can, or subjective relations can never be strong because you are not born as as Maori. Subjective isn't born. It doesn't mean you were born that way. It just means you are a member of a social category. So, like, you can be say, so like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to take right, this. Off, the, so I'll just do this very, very briefly, which is. Like it's a member of a sub social category, and then you can emphasize their membership of the social category. That's sub R plus. Or you could then say, take the same person and say, actually, we're going to, and the same argument, but we're going to emphasize the fact that they did that through, you know, this sort of engagement with various cultural things or language or whatever it might be, which would be shoving up the IR. Mm. But should we come back to that later, if you like, and then let Brian carry on with his yes. thing? <laughs> I'll just I'll just add one other interesting wrinkle is because of course there was a day when I actually did knock on the door for the very first time of the school, and the reason they let me in is because I'm a mathematics expert. <laughs> so I'll just leave that there as well. <laughs> uh, so I first approached the school to do mathematics uh, professional development. But I could speak Te Reo Māori, so I could do all that in Te Reo Māori. But that knowledge was important in, in opening the doors. Um, yes, okay, yes. So just a very quick, um, uh, which sort of connects with what we we're just talking about, um, but we won't dwell on it any longer. Um, the mainstream sections were, not, were strong knowledge codes and very uh, quite clearly a discursive epistemic relation in the sense of students were being asked to uh, acquire an existing discourse about a particular topic. Um, so by, by reading textbooks, by reading articles, they were expected to learn what people were saying about this. Um, and interactive social relations in the sense of uh, it didn't matter who you were, uh, but as long as you conducted yourself in a certain way, interacted with others in a certain way, presented essays in the correct format, that was all good. Uh, the Māori sections had a NOAA code tendency, weaker, and I think they were weaker because uh, of them being placed in amongst sections that were strong knowledge code. Um, so, uh, what I under my understanding, what an ontic epistemic relation is, there were efforts made to engage uh, with real events that were happening at the time, 
uh, or real events that were happening in people's lives and the subjective social relation, which was uh, basically if you're Māori, it's all good. And that's a simplification and I won't dwell on that um, too much for now. Um, in terms of autonomy, so I was particularly interested in movements around the autonomy plane and in the mainstream sections, I found a, quite a quite a sort of clear sort of tri what I'm you know a triangular tour from uh, the sort of um, from a sovereign code to an exotic code, interjected code, and then back again. Uh, in the Māori sections, I was I was puzzled. There seemed to be it seemed to be quite almost random until I learnt to <laughs> to see what was there. And there's, so certainly all four quadrants, let's say, all four um, modes of, of the autonomy plane were quite prominent. And there appeared to be sort of circulations involving like two triangular things simultaneously sort of enveloping, uh, including all of the four sort of quadrants. Um, but then I did this thing of thinking, oh, you know, what I'm considering to be the target may be wrong. And taking into take, taking into account the uh, sort of the the Noah code orientation, I sort of redid I redid the analysis with the lecturer themselves as the sovereign as the target. And then it seemed to be that I got another kind of triangular core going on. Um, so that's what I'm going to just talk about briefly now and show some diagrams and uh, expose my thinking. Um, here we go. Um, so I've done it like this. So, you know, the top and the side, I've just put in what I think would, would be called a uh, translation device. Um, so this course um, was a course dealing vaguely, I say vaguely, but it was it was a sort of collection of theories about human development. And so when I talk about a theory, I'm talking about a theory of, of human development. I'm just going to use Bronfen Brenner's sort of ecological model as the sort of iconic theory that this course dealt with. Um, and so I won't. I won't read them. I won't sort of read the things out. But um, you know, it's um, you know when the lecturer was talking about the theory and the concepts in the theory and how the concepts were organised in a sort of you know the say the Bronfen Brenner sort of hierarchy, if you like, of micro, meso, exo, and macro. Then they're in. Then it's they're in this sovereign territory of. Uh, strong relational and positional autonomy um and then you, you know, moving down sort of down the right hand side there positional autonomy start with you know so when the lecturer is talking about kinds of theory uh what uh sort of epistemological uh, sort of ideas about theory personal understandings of theory and then sort of other contexts other uh, sort of context. So that's that's how I was sort of deciding on uh, the sort of strength of those. Uh, kia ora. Uh, Hi. Hi, Brian. Um, I'd just like to clarify, and um, by the way, I'm Marietta from South Africa. Kia ora. Uh, so looking a bit at decolonial things in my context, um, I'm not uh, so familiar with autonomy, so I might be, you know, messing things up but I just want to ask so as far as I understand relational autonomy is about like the target purpose and yes. positional autonomy is about the target uh, knowledge right um, so I'm not sure how the things that you have there in like purpose the theory I'm not sure what that that yes. means you know yes. like 
Usually I'd expect something like the purpose of the knowledge is you need to use it in this kind of way. That's more what I was expecting to see there. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's just me being uh, too sort of shorthand in what I've written there. Um, so that's that's my understanding too. Um, although, you know, this this is one of the points that I that I would perhaps need some help with. Actually, I'm sort of so the way I've put uh, relational autonomy there. I'm sort of thinking of, um, uh, for example. The, the the actual concepts of of a theory and the relational autonomy is is to do with uh, how those concepts are interrelated the 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 sort of strength with which those concepts are related to each other so in Bronfenbrenner's case they're related in a sort of hierarchy you know two 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 micros make a macro and two macros make a I mean a meso and you know that that sort of thing um, but I'm also sort of combining that with the re the purpose for doing things so when I put the theory there um, so the, the purpose that this that the lecturer is talking about the concepts and how they're organized is is to explain that to students so that they understand get an understanding of the theory. And so that's what I mean by purpose. Uh, oh, is it so that they, sorry. <laughs> is it the so that they is trying to teach students what this, what this theory is about and what it means. Yeah, but, so but, that, but is the purpose to get them to understand something about Maori culture? No. Um, no, okay. No, so this, this is in the mainstream sections of the course. Mm -hmm. And it is, I mean, it, it, if you were to scan through, so the reason I put the same, the theory, the theory, the theory, the theory, all the way through there, is because actually there's nothing in the mainstream sections that's not related in some way to supporting students to learn to understand what a theory, this particular, what a theory means. So even, even when we get down here that I've, that I've, Put it, you know, as the, the double minus there. It's it's about assignments, but then when you when you see what the assignments are actually like, they actually mirror the same sort of triangle tour that is that that dominates the sort of pedagogical space. And so the the assignments are there to reinforce the learning of the theory as well, just not in a, not in an explicit sense. So Brian, you were saying this is what you wanted to do as a bit of a chat about like, yes, using yes. autonomy and stuff. So this is really, yes. really valuable for me as well to chat about this too, which is like the first thing with uh, autonomy is, uh, is always probably the easiest thing is to set up the target. You know, what yes. are the target contents? What are the target purpose? Yes. And then to watch out for the watch out for something um, like this doesn't shouldn't affect your minuses and pluses, but watch out for the argument that everything is serving teaching teaching the target. Because people always say that. They'll say, oh, well, letting the kid go to the toilet is eventually serving oh, yes. the learning of the mathematics that I'm doing in this class. And you think, oh, for fuck's sake, that's really not what we're talking about here. Because that's not, I mean, like there's purpose. And then there's like the attenuation of a purpose to like ultimate goal. Because then everything in education ever done is, is like, you know, supposedly inside the target. So I mean, like if you're saying that the, per well, so in these mainstream sections, just to clarify, so we know, so we can then follow your patterns that are going to come, mm -hmm. which I think are going to be really interesting. The target, so the, the aim, uh, what they want to try to teach, the target contents, as it were, the positional autonomy, that's about these theories of, I can't remember what the theories were. There were theories of? Uh, so human development, theories of human, human development. development. Okay, yes. so every time there's content in there, there's like stuff about those specific theories, that yes. would be like that's definitely inside their target yes. um and then 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 anything that isn't that at the first level anyway is going to be something is like going to be outside it like the minor stuff is always um a miscellaneous it's like always everything else yes so yeah so that's what you're getting there and then i think in relational to autonomy the purpose is to teach these 
Yes. It sounds like a double, um, it sounds like redundant, but it is not redundant at all because we often find the content of something can involve like, um, say you're, you know, you're teaching something mathematical, but actually the purpose is to be able to teach a scientific, you know, is to do a scientific experiment. So it becomes like, you know, PA plus RA minus. So you can have a different purpose. So the purpose is to teach these ecological, um, you know, theories, okay. Um, but when you, so, so I'd say you're right for things like how to do assignments are definitely not RA plus because that, that's not, I mean, I know it's ultimately to teach the theory, but I would instantly in my head go, right, that's definitely double minus, that's way away from the actual, um, you know, uh, the actual, the, the purpose here. So, but I think what you've got there is if you don't watch out, like you could confuse people outside of this um, uh, uh, golden circle here. If, um, if you say that the purpose is ultimately always teaching the theory, because I think we have to say, yeah, is it really? Because otherwise, if you say like everything can become that, do you know what I mean? It's like, um, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like um, when one of the things that I found this so useful for is trying to understand how, as people may have read in the autonomy tours papers, it's like how science teachers go about teaching a, a bit of maths when it's the language of science. And if you don't have that really strong idea of what the target purpose is, um, then you can easily not see that they've gone out of that target purpose to do a bit of maths for maths sake in order to get everyone up to speed. Everybody now knows what graphing is about. And now yes. we're going to be bringing it back to use in the scientific yes. way. So if we don't watch out, because then people would say to me, oh, that, that, that thing they went off and did, that is now for the purpose of, um, there's a temporal thing here as well, if you're doing classroom stuff. So people, when the teacher goes off and does something else, like, okay, I need everyone to get up to speed on this graphing. Or when I teach and I'm going, here's an example of deviance, because I teach deviance. Um, and I have to get all the kids up to speed on this example from Australian history, because none of them have heard it. And so I go off and I tell them about the story of like, mm -hmm. you know, children being flung off a boat, or whatever, and things like that. Yeah, and sure. um, um, I have to do that for a bit. But then I come back and say, okay, now using that, we can use that to illustrate the theory of moral panic. And somebody might say to me, ah, but wasn't it always there for that purpose? And I go, you can't go back in time when you're coding. So for the time period when I was saying, oh, let me tell you about John Howard and this whole children in the water stuff and so on. When I was doing that, I was definitely outside my purpose. And then I take it and I transform it to an illustration of moral panics so i think like when they're doing things like how to do assignments it is definitely outside their target purpose so you're right to have it right over there yes uh kia ora Carl. yes um okay i'm hoping that my whole analysis doesn't fall to bits now uh, <laughs> no 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 i didn't argue with you i didn't disagree with you i was just saying you know i don't think the purpose is the theory you know no. i don't think i well, think the purpose yeah. in the moment is to teach how to do assignments. And then often yes. you might find they then say, okay, now, yes. now we can then use these ideas. So like, for example, I'll stop in a second, but I just love discussion uh, in these places and the smaller group yeah. allows us to have that. Um, for example, if you go off, if we in a lecture, in a, in a, in a seminar or tutor or something, we say, okay, something simple like, okay, to, you know, I'm talking about the assignment and it's about say, Richard Sennett's, account of new capitalism some sort of thing I have to teach so um okay and then I say okay so you want to do a research essay on this now remember when you're doing a research essay I want this and I want this and I want introduction I want a conclusion I want some stuff I want clear scaffolding I want blah blah blah, mm. blah blah so I do all this stuff that's very generic and then I say so and then I might might leave it there but I you know or I might go right so how do we then use that to talk about Richard Senate. At that point, I'm turning it to purpose. But when I was telling them about the generic stuff, I was definitely yeah. not doing it for the purpose. Yes. While I'm doing it, I'm not doing it for the purpose of teaching Richard Senate. So I'm definitely, definitely, definitely outside my target purpose there. Now I may then bring it back and say, mm. so how do we use that stuff? Or I might not. I might just drop it and let them be, figure that out. But we can't, we can never go back in time and say retrospectively, we yes. now see, because then that ruins the idea of being able to see someone turning it for purpose. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. 
Cool. Very good. I, I, might, I also wanted to say that out loud because it's one of those things where I've had very long discussions with people in the room about how to do that. And I'm sure I have never really said that much except for like one sentence somewhere. Mm. Jade. Oh, that's really interesting. So can I, may I ask a question just to clarify my thinking really? about this? Yeah. So, so is there so how do you track back or when you're doing coding and, and you're 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 you know maybe it's somebody else's lesson that you're you're coding. Um, how do you distinguish between those digressions that, that sort of are digressions as part of what a teacher decides in the moment is needed? Um, and then how do you decide whether actually they did intend to do that? That was part of their plan all along. You know, I mean, is that do you need data no, that means you I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take this one, Brian. It's like um uh, it's not whether. I mean, it's not their intention all along. It's like, what are they doing at any one moment? So right. when they're talking, so like um, when I was analyzing, um, so I, I analyzed in the autonomy tours paper, I analyzed this teacher who who tries to uh, to teach students about how to find Italy in a map because they're doing the Roman Empire. And she says like, it looks like a boot. So they find the boot on the map, right? So in that point, she's just, she's outside her target purpose because she's just trying to get them to find a boot on a map. Now we know ultimately, we know that ultimately she's going to come back or maybe she doesn't because it's never, never, never like, you might say, oh, well, we know what she's trying to do, but she never comes back. She never comes back to Roman empire stuff. She never gave, uh, there was a one I didn't talk that I never, I think it's on the YouTube for LCT2. It is on YouTube, for LCT2, where I analyzed this uh, teacher who goes off on this discussion of how garlic was used in the medieval period and she never comes back. So like often teachers may have this intention of going off and coming back and saying, oh, but ultimately I was intending, you know, it doesn't matter. We, we analyze what they're doing at any one moment. And then when they never come back, we can go, uh, I think you never came back. And this is the result of that. And it, it may not always be negative, but often it is, you know, they kind of, she never managed to, the boot woman never managed to get the, t the class to come back to the Roman empire and she had to change the topic and move on to a new phase of the lesson the garlic woman just lost the class entirely um so you know if you don't have that moment of then intentionally showing right how do we use that and then you know so we just do it moment by moment effectively and never pretend that we know oh ultimately they meant that you know it's like well yeah you may have meant it but you may have intended it but you didn't you know it's like yeah. the difference between saying yeah. like there's the yeah. target you wanted now we're going to see where your arrows actually at land, you know, like <laughs> so you may have wanted every single one into the center of your target, but actually several of them hit, hit children and now half your, half your class are dead. Yes. <laughs> but I hand it back to Brian. I'm happy sure. to chat about this at any point. Uh, this is okay. this is awesome and um, exactly what I was hoping for. And um, I'm hoping that what I'm about to present will still have some some meaning. Um, so um, this is uh, sort of rather an adequate sort of representation of um, you know taking each sort of um, uh, not not utterance exactly, but um, you know a, a spoken sort of unit, say in a lecture. So these are analyses of lectures. Um, so not not the course, not the course sort of materials which. Uh, in the mainstream sections actually take have a similar similar sort of pattern um so um what what i so what i'm talking trying to show here is how usually um the the um you know the the sort of the talk started in in talking about the theory this is from from brenner's theory and it involves this concept and this concept and then some sort of move towards uh, as a, a real or realistic context, which on the face of it has nothing to do with. Uh, I'm going to give a little example of how you know how I thought about this next. Um, uh, and then, having talked about that context, say in its own terms, 
um, a move is made over here where the sort of elements of that context are rearranged and be, they, they begin to be talked of, talked about in terms of the theory. So I'm interpreting that as that, that, that moment in time when the lecturer starts to reinterpret what's in a context in relation to the theory. And then having sort of identified, oh, yeah, that in the context is an example of a microsystem and so on, they, in that process, bring it back into the sort of sovereign territory, if you like. So you're saying, so to, just to interpret that as well, the way I sort of think about these things is that that movement of that right arrow at the bottom, that's turning to purpose. That's the way I think about yes. it anyway, yes, turning it to purpose. To yeah, as you ramp up the relational theory, you turn it to the purpose, and then you kind of reintegrate it with target content. Yes. So, I mean, sometimes that happens almost in one move, but some, yeah. you, know, you can often, yes. often actually that you'll get these moments where they'll go, so what was the point of, you know, what was the point of that thing? And then, and then yes. they'll start turning it to the purpose and then they'll say, and then that connects to what we talked before. Yes. You know? uh, that's yeah. when it's done really well, by the way. Um, yeah. This, these, these, uh, this integration and turning to purpose often doesn't happen very often. Yes. And so, um, you know, from that point of view, this this was a dominant way. In fact, it was sort of it, it got it became sort of quite repetitious, actually. The you know, but, um, you know, in the same lecture, different theories were dealt with, not just the Bronfenbrenner's one, but other theories. And this same sort of the same pattern was used to uh, for students to sort of gain clarity about each of the theories, but. Um, uh, just just to go back to this thing about um, assignments, um, which uh, is you know sort of is a sort of question mark. That's why I've actually put it with a dashed line. Um, so it's the, uh, and so what I'm focusing on here is what the assignments were actually like, and so what constituted guiding students in how to do an assignment was to the assignment, the assignment was set up as um, basically a list of uh, a collection of scenarios describing a real context. And so the discussion of the assignment was in fact a discussion of how each uh, uh, of you know what that students had to look at it, pick a scenario, and relate the sort of elements of that scenario to a particular theory. So, um, so I, I, I sort of, I'm thinking of that as actually a, the assignment itself also embodies the same triangular pattern. And so I'm not really sure whether to put it over there or just include it in with all the rest. Um, yes. Sorry. So can I just, it's Lee, yeah. it's Lee again. Um, I, I'm kind of going to get, get to where, where you've, where, what you've just asked, but um, my, my sense is that you've got something in your translation device that might not be helping you to get what yes. way you, you are, are doing it in a very clear way. Yes. Um, if you look at your positional autonomy, Yes. You move from a specific theory, which is Bronf and Brenner, to yes. kind of, um, you know, understanding, you know, just kind of general ecosystem or, or, or social theories, personal understandings, and then anything else. And yes. that kind of progression from something very specific to something, you know, that could be, that could be anything um, is really useful. Mm. And then you know, to, to mirror that on relational autonomy. So the purpose is to understand this particular theory, to understand social context or whatever, um, to understand society more generally, and then to understand anything else. I think that your how to, how to do assignments is one example of yeah. what could be in a very wide category anything else. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if your relational autonomy shouldn't also go from a very specific purpose to a very broad mm. purpose that 
And one example of it yes. is doing assignments, but it could be, you know, blowing your nose or whatever. Um, but but just kind of, so, so so it's it's like you've got an example yeah. for RA minus minus where an organizing principle. Yes. yes. You know, or, or a manifestation of that organizing principle, the different strength of that organizing principle. So yes. I, I think that might you know, be worth thinking about. Yes. Yes, I would definitely think about that. Um, thank you, Lee. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'll just sort of say what I said before, that this is exactly what I was hoping people would do. And thank you. And I will certainly think about that. And I, I know that I know that there may be some, some sort of problems with the way I've set this up. Um, and I'm, I may not have put it exactly very clearly, but um, so um, anyway, um, let, let me just push on and sort of give a and look at an example involving Bronfenbrenner of of a particular little sequence from data, and you know how I made sense of it, which is pretty much what I said in the in the picture in the in describing the diagram. Um, so uh so this this is a this is in relation to teaching about Bronfenbrenner's ecological theory. And um I sort of summarize that first bit. Um so that the, the lecture says quite a bit more than that, but I didn't want to put everything in there. But basically it's an out, it's a sort of description of the different concepts involved in the theory. And um, and how they're set up, how, uh, you know, uh, meso is a sort of constellation of microsystems. And there's a sort of, di there's the usual sort of circular, you know, concentric rings diagram displayed for that. Um, but then the lecturer sort of actually sort of asks, sort of talks to a student who's on the front row there and asks these questions, you know, what's, so, what's your family like? And, and you can read it there. It's, oh, well, you've know, got my mum and dad. And you do sport? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I play, play for the play for university rugby team. Um, and so probably your family and rugby team don't know each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Because, you know, I'm in Palmerston North and my family's down the other end of the country in Invercargill. Um, and so that's just talking about someone's family, um, which has nothing to do with Bronfenbrenner and nothing to do with anything. Um, but then, then the uh, lecturer starts to say, starts to interpret that in terms of the theory, and that's where that's what I'm saying is is a move into this interjected code, where you know I understand that as taking the elements of one context and rearranging them to have the same sort of interrelations as 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 exists in the sort of sovereign in the target. Um, in the target area, and so here's here's a the description is that um, you know oh so your family is one microsystem with you in it and your rugby team is another one and because there's no interaction between them we're going to we call that a a weakly connected meso system and you know that's oh sorry that's then moving back into this into the sort of target area and that's you know that that sort of was fairly typical of what happened a lot of the time in this so particular Brian, can i just jump in for a second that sounds like i mean i may be getting this wrong but that sounds like a fantastic example of interjection you know where you take you take this thing that seems to be out there somewhere and then you go aha now what you've just given me and then you kind of do you sort of do this little bit of magic the kind of pedagogic this is where I think the pedagogic work like lies in this sort of movement of things across the autonomy plane. This is why I love the autonomy plane so much because you can actually start to see how awesome teaching actually is in terms of how it changes the very nature of knowledge. Um, and uh, and I don't mean in terms of all this sort of nonsense about like simple shit about pure and applied and all that stuff. I mean like the way in which it actually changes its sort of in organizing principles to be like what seems to be just a chat about something then suddenly is now being used Yes. as the material but so they it's still the same contents it's still like non-target content 
but now it's being interjected, it's being turned into, it's turned to purpose. And, um, and that's really awesome. That, by the way, um, is also, I mean, let's not ever forget this, that when the, uh, yeah, exactly, alchemy and art of teaching, yes. It is, it's alchemy. It's turning like base materials into gold at this point, or it can be when it's interjecting. I like that one, Jay. That's really awesome way of describing it. And it's, um, but what's, I mean, what's really amazing about that is that the way it kind of like, um, it just, it's, it's, yeah, it's taking this non-target material, but turning it into the, uh, something. And in doing so, modeling that, so one of the things that if you if you never if you never model introjection, your students are never going to see that uh, if they never get to see that movement, then and then you say, OK, I want you to write essays where you use examples or personal experiences and things like that. It's really hard for them to turn that personal experience or that example or that case into something that's supposed to be turned to the purpose of what the essay is about. Um, and then this will cripple any semantic waves you want. So like if you don't do that kind of interjection stuff, you can go down to an you know, empirical example or personal experience all you like, and then have another bit of theory all you like. And you won't get that move up. You know, it's that movement up that involves interjection. Okay. Kia ora. Very good. Okay, now that, that, that ends my bit about the mainstream. And I'm going to talk about the one section that is a Maori section and uh, the same sort of setup. Um, so the, these, what I've written in these tables is 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 a sort of um, short version of of a, of a longer sort of description. Um, but um, the target here, the reason I put target here is because I'm going to do another sort of autonomy plane where the target is not what it seems to be so um this 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 section is actually sort of advertised to students if you like as maori model of human development so okay i took it at face value that's the target so uh this lecture is about helping students to understand maori models of human development i'm interested in the fact that they're not called Māori theories. In the mainstream section, they're called theories of human development, but here they're called Māori models of human development, which may or may not be significant. Um, so uh, there's, there's a whole um, other thing going on here, which I found very puzzling to start with. Um, so in terms of positional autonomy, as you would expect, so plus plus, you know, the lecturer is talking about the, the elements of the Māori model and how they're set up. Um, moving down this scale, it's sort of interesting what, what uh, you know, what actually crops up there. Um, there's, so in order to, in order to, achieve, to understand the Māori model, then the lecturer spends quite a lot of time explaining to students what um, and I'm sort of sensing a problem with this now, having <laughs> having had our discussion this evening. Um, uh, sort of cultural concepts, in particular, in Maori terms, of what a person is, uh, which is necessary in order to understand what that you know to get an understanding of what that model actually what the model's about. Uh, I was very interested to see how Western theories were positioned as uh, away from the sort of target. Um, and then basically anything else, but uh, um, you know, societal conditions, history and sort of personal, the self-personal sort of experiences of the lecturer themselves. Um, uh, so I've clicked my button <laughs> a bit too early, but um, um, so let me just click it again. Um, so th these are sort of the sort some of the sort of tours that I sort of detected with this sort of scheme. I haven't talked about relational autonomy, but I'll just leave that there for now. Um, 
and so I was, so you know I was quite puzzled by all of this. It's you know on the first, uh, if you just sit there and listen to this lecture, uh, it appears to be quite random, sort of jumping around different things going on. But um, after, after some uh, after a while, the, there is there is a different sort of pattern to it. There's a different there's a different thing going on here about how things are related to each other. And this this is where my interest really started to peak because, um, you know, I'm sort of forming this idea here that, okay, what I'm what I'm looking at here is a sort of Maori mode of discourse, which is actually dealing with different categories and relating to them in different ways, distinctly different ways to the mainstream section to the mainstream sections. Um, so. Um, In particular, it's so that the the sort of the strength of this um, you know the projected code is is pretty interesting to me. And I'm into so that's there because I'm interpreting uh, sort of the many instances when the lecturer, having talked about a particular Maori model, and I'll, I'll give an example of that shortly then moved across here still talking about the model but how it supported uh emancipatory actions in the in the caring professions um and was and gave particular examples real examples of the use of those models with people that she knew about that she'd done herself uh so that's how I'm interpreting that. And that was a very distinctive feature. That just wasn't, wasn't uh, present in the mainstream sections. Um, and I, and I, you know, in terms of, in terms of uh, NOAA code, I'm actually, so that's I'm associating that with a sort of on-pick epistemic relation. Um, okay, um, anything else there? Oh yeah, so uh, this is so this is the example of something uh, from data, and it it deals with this uh, Maori. Um, well, it's not. I mean, this is the other thing. So I, I wouldn't say this is a model of human development. It's actually a model of what a person is in Maori terms. And Jay, you you'll be able, you'll be familiar with the Fari Tapafa, in which. Um, a person is represented as a fare and with a with a simple a simple um, house with a roof and and land and walls and each part represents a different component of what makes a complete human in Maori terms. So there's a spiritual element, uh, uh, a bodily element, a psychological, mental element, um, a social, uh, a whānau, a family element. But also an element of land connection to land, and in this turn, all of those elements have to be strong for the person to be whole and well. But uh, the lecturer sort of sort of proceeded like this. So talking about, you know, when I, you know, when I turn up to a lecture like this, I'm never alone. I have my ancestors with me and my descendants, but not just my descendants. All of my whānau, uh, family, sub-tribe and tribe, all of their descendants as well, they're with me. Um, then I move into the sort of sovereign territory, actually talking about what the Tapafā is, just as I explained it there, pretty much. And then moving into, again, this in, what, I, what I interpret to be this in, introjection, but talking about herself. Um, so talking about the fact that she thinks of herself as being with her ancestors as part of the spiritual side, um, can't see them, I don't talk to them, but I can feel them with me. Um, I'm made from the whenua in which my ancestors lived. So connection with the whenua is part of me too, and so on. So she uses her own situation to, uh, to show what the components of that model are. And then 
back to something like which I consider to be sort of exotic. I'm feeling good now. And so that's seems to be a very different sort of movement. Pavel, kia ora, a question. Um, yeah, so um, a quick one. Um, so you mentioned that the patterns that you saw there was distinct and so that we can see perhaps Maori way of discourse. Yes. Uh, is, is that correct? So but my question here is, how do we know that it's Maori way of discourse? Because so earlier, Kara mentioned a paper where he analyzed autonomy. And if I remember correctly, it was like, two different teachers doing the same lesson, right? And and Carl oh. found different uh, autonomy tours. So if we have, how many samples do you need to collect to say that here we're seeing a distinctly yeah. Maori type yeah. of knowledge portrayal? It could, it could simply be personal idiosyncrasy, right? What you see. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I don't have an answer to that apart from um, my own sort of experience, not in English, I have to say. This is, I mean, this is something that I still have to think about because, you know, it, it, you know, when when I'm in a, uh, you know, a setting where Te Reo Māori is being spoken, there's no English, then I, then you know, I have to work in a with with a different um, in a different world with. And people speak about things differently, and there are different categories that, that exist, and they relate to each other in different ways. So, in Te Reo Māori, in, in the, when we work in in a, in, in a Māori language, um, it's very clear that there is a particular mode of discourse. It's part of it's part of speaking the language. Um, and so what intrigues me here, and I don't, I don't know if it's the case, and I think that's that's a great point, and it's something that I've thought about myself. Am I just seeing, am I just seeing bad teaching, or am I seeing something distinctly different, but coherent and in its own way, a different thing? Am I seeing a different phenomenon here, or am I just seeing random stuff because the teacher doesn't know what they're doing? Um, I want to say at this stage, and I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough data actually to say one way or the other. But I'm going to say that if this that that a Maori, even in English, a Maori discursive mode mode of discourse exists, and that's that's actually the basis on which the the rest of my talk is. <laughs> that's what it's based on, actually. Um, so perhaps a bit speculative, but it's interesting, but nonetheless. So that it might be interesting if there is such a case where, say, a Maori teacher talks about the same thing to Maori students in Maori, and then about the same thing, but in English to non-Maoris, where the the autonomy tours would differ, and then we yes. could perhaps put a, forward a stronger case that there is a distinct way of. Yes, formulating knowledge. Yes, I guess uh, what I'm what I'm going to say is that even if it, even though English is being spoken here, that at least there is something of a Maori discourse coming through in that. Mm. And you know we're, we're in a we are in a it's it's a colonized situation, so you know Maori things get muffled and damped down and mixed with other things. And I think this is a case of that. Um, so, so you're going back to that that diagram. So some of that might just be random, where the teacher just gets distracted and talks about stuff and you know drops off the edge or something. But I'm 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 working on the hypothesis that some of that pattern is actually derived from a Maori mode discourse mode. I think it's a great. I think it's a great working hypothesis. And one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to have that kind of thing, which is like you start seeing something and you just hold, trying to hold that, like um, to hold the notion of a hypothesis open as long as you can, um, is uh, is really important. Because I'm, I'm not saying, by the way, that Powell's doing this, but it is so easy for them for things to be shot down really quickly, or for them people or people to make conversely people to make claims. 
way too soon. Um, and but to have a, a hypothesis that you know we might be seeing something systematic here, and then like now I need to see it in other things. I think is a great idea. I mean that's where this stuff originally comes from. Anyway, it's like seeing loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of teachers. But it started when you know noticing it wasn't like it wasn't when we an, uh, analyzed stuff at autonomy tours. It wasn't that we um, we analyzed everybody and then found the best ones. It was more watching teachers and thinking this is really good teaching, and then noticing something and then going oh hang on this signature seems to be also over here and then here and here and then building up that sense and then notice and then you when you finally see it, you go oh christ it's everywhere this thing in good teaching but you know but it all came from one person originally but as Paul was pointing out you know you to say it's distinctively Mary might be a stretch but there's something here potentially different to the other section that warrants further yeah. discussion and exploration. I think that's awesome. I mean, I mean, yeah, agree on, I mean, having some kind of hypothesis and holding on to it. Agree with that. Um, I'm just thinking, as Bourdieu would say, objectify, right? So uh, when you see a result, then try to ask yourself whether, whether you're seeing the result because of some preconceptions that you come with to, to, to the research. Yeah. Mm. Well, oh, I wasn't criticizing you, Pablo. <laughs> no, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> so I, I'm definitely bringing something to this, which which is a something, you know, preconceived idea. I am bringing my own understandings of Māori discourse from being from engaging and participating in it myself. So I am bringing something there. Um, but anyway. Pavel Kilda for that. I mean, that that has that given me an extra bit of clarity about that. To, to the point of, well, I, you know, I hadn't even thought about that. That actually, I am, I do have this working hypothesis there. So it's actually clarified that for me. So Kilda. Um, but then, uh, so just been through, I've been through that. But then, um, so as I said, I was sort of a bit puzzled by this and thinking. Um, and this this might this might be some work you know can interpret this work as sort of going on that that hypothesis uh, that it, that there is something systematically mouldy about this. Um, I thought about I thought about the possibility that the target was wrong, that even though officially the target was supposed to be Maori models of human development, that in practice what the lecturer was actually doing was not that at all, and that. Uh, and again, thinking about, generally speaking, Māori context being NOAA code, I thought about doing a reanalysis where the target is the lecturer themselves, their own person, their own experiences. And when I did that and rejigged things a little bit, um, and of course, it's the same, the same things are being said, they're just sort of categorised differently. I found that this kind of thing happened. A lot of those things came over here. Some of those moved down there. Some of those moved over there. Some moved over there. And I ended up with a sort of triangular tour again, but this time in relation to that person. Everything was related to the person. In, but the person understood in a very in an interesting way. The person understood not as a not as a, a single individual, but as a collective, as a member of a collective, who's actually engaged in an emancipatory struggle. Um, so I this. I th That's this is awesome, a Brian. That's really great because what you might have, <laughs> I think, what you found here is something's really fascinating, which is like from the perspective of the target of the wider thing it looks this way but then when you sort of reorient to realize that this part may have a different target then it looks the same yes um and then you've got like or similar and so what you might be finding is that you've got yeah two competing targets or two un different understandings of what the target contents and purposes are even though yeah. you've yeah. got the same fundamental like um, analytics, as I call them, movements, patterns going on, um, but yes. for with different contents and different purposes. 
which might make sense of all sorts of jarring um, disconnects when things one thing is put inside another thing, when one, one thing is added to another thing, one thing is supposedly integrated into another thing, but never feels like it is. It might be because of this often hidden nature of there being very different notions of what the target is. Yes, yes. And so one of, one of the things that really interested me is, because I always understood that triangular sort of core, as you, as you were saying, Carl, mm. as good pedagogy. That's what good teachers do. And yet when I saw with the target as the Māori models of human development, then I saw something that was not, didn't seem to be good. <laughs> it was not good practice. It was seemed to be all over the place. Um, but rearranging it this way, we sort of, the again that actually there is there is good pedagogy here you just have to know what the target is um and so i'd so looking i just this this is the same corridor the same talk that we had before but this time if we say that the sovereign territory is the lecturer herself then she actually starts in sovereign territory on the target she's on target and um, then talks about something that's not not about her, but it's it's, it's it was sort of, it's a little, I have a little bit of difficulty here. It's it's not about her, but it's sort of quite related. <laughs> it's not too far away, uh, so that's why I put sort of weak sovereign or exotic. Um, and then there's an interjection, and then interjected code, and then back to sovereign. So exactly the same data, but now we see a different thing going on altogether. Um, so uh, yes, that's that's the sort of, that's as far as I've got with the analysis, but I, I also interviewed some students in, in this course, uh, Māori students and Pākehā students, that's non, that's the word for non-Māori or, you know, Pākehā is sort of uh, European New Zealanders. Uh, do I use the word Pākehā here? No. Not yet. Um, but reaction. So I was very interested by some of the reactions from Māori students. And this, this is interesting because, you know, we've been talking about that sort of autonomy tour as being a sort of exemplary pedagogy. And yet some Māori students sort of resisted it and actually had problems with it because or their experience of it was that, you know, their family, what they do, how they live, was being explained away by someone else's theory. And, you know, what well, I didn't write it here, but one student said, you know, it's like being colonized. Um, so some students reacted that way. Uh, others, there's a range of students. I was very interested by a Māori student who said, well, no, this, it's very clear. This is what I must do to succeed. This is what I've got to do and be like to succeed. Um, and there's a, there's a whole related one that's there, it's sort of set there, but I'm interested by, um, I've got to be, I've got to do this so that a person like me, brown skin person, so I can show that someone like me can succeed. And then there's a sort of this curious dichotomy that comes up. It's like, if I succeed, it's because I'm not being myself. But if I fail, then I just confirm that brown people can't do this stuff. And so, I was so I'm sort of intrigued by this. I, and I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I've come across it before, where it seems like exemplary pedagogy is happening, but it has a particular effect on Māori students. Um, and not a good effect. Yeah, kia ora. Edsel, is it? Uh, yeah, Dominic. Um, Dominic. Yeah, sorry, yeah, Dominic. I'm in Japan. Of course. <laughs> um, <Kia ora. laughs> um, I just wondered if um, you, you had the, when you did the first analysis of the relational code and the purpose, you were looking at the, the kind of curriculum purpose effectively. Yes, and then for the second time, you're looking as uh, as the lecturer's purpose, right? I'm just yeah. wondering if the the students who objected were picking up more on the purpose of the curriculum, 
and and they could and less so maybe on the lecturer or if they could see that the the lecturer was effectively saying you know if you want to be you know want to be like me you have to kind of move away from you know move into this projected code in some yes. some stages i um it just yeah i think i don't know it just seemed to me like there was the the first, those projected codes were more about the curriculum um initially right like uh, the holder curriculum because you said that this Maori section was the only one section within the yeah. course right yeah yes. um and kind of like, i don't know it struck me like it, maybe it's a fig leaf effectively like yeah it's supposed to be about a system and so on and but maybe that this lecture is inadvertently signaling their acceptance of colonization um i don't know maybe i maybe i misunderstood that's maybe why they're objecting is this it's about them but also that that lecture but also them fitting into the the idea of that colonization still happening um mm. i know um i don't know what do you think is that am i completely misunderstanding or um I, I have to say I'm I'm not entirely following what you're what you're asking actually, Dominic. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is like if you go back to the um to the codes, the one before this, the yes. where the codes, the projected codes are on the on the left. Yes. Yes. Right. So it's this relational autonomy and um yes. societal transformation, emancipation. So they're you're kind of um these are things positive aspects of of the non-maori culture right it's almost like um you know say um some ways maybe signaling the acceptable parts of colonization right, right? yeah um and although the the lecturer themselves then moves those across so if you go to the second one Right, like the as you said, like the lecturer from their perspective, they see it across the moving across yes. to um positive um maybe if you go to the the next one. This one where things move yeah, across. Yeah, yes. yeah, when it moves across. Yes. Um maybe that's that's how the lecturer sees it. But the students are some of the students are seeing still seeing it as as the first um right. coding rather right. than the second yes yeah so i think i think you're getting at actually one of them the main points that i want to make actually i think sorry um, <laughs> sure. thank you for that but i think um may, maybe you know in the previous one so what i was talking about there this projected code is when the lecturer starts to talk about how those maori models have actually made a difference in real context all Māori in an emancipatory self then um so that 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 so it's like turning those turning those uh models to a pur to a purpose of emancipation which i which is a which i that's my understanding of what a projective code is um but i think i think what you're saying is something i'm about to say myself let's just switch forward uh, so these reactions, I didn't make it clear. So these are Māori students who are talking about the mainstream sections, their experience in the mainstream sections. And what I didn't put there is, of course, they, they didn't have any problems in the Māori section. That was cool for them. Uh, from non-Māori students talking about, so I just, I just focused on the crossover. So... Pahia students happy in the mainstream sections, but when they were talking about the Māori sections, a range of things. Oh, I enjoyed it. It was fun, but it was off task. Uh, I got an insight. You know, so you can read it there. I'm just repeating it. 
uh, students who seem to be inspired by it to want to learn to do Māori for some reason. Um, too, too personal, too social. It was interesting, but not related. And there were some more objectionable ones sort of hinted at in the last one. Oh, it's just there for political correctness, virtue signaling. It's not important. I didn't learn anything from it. And so, so it's 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 leading so it's so it's leading me to this discussion, this sort of grappling um, with what this might all mean. And um, I feel like I'm running out of time, so I'll just speed it up. Yeah, we've gone we've gone way over, so uh, wrapping up soon would be great. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to wrap up. Um, there's a number of there's, there's a number of sort of consequences that I'm sort of thinking about, but they they all sort of centre on this. Uh, Parkes, uh, so non Māori students not being able to recognise uh, the Māori discourse that is happening in um, in the Māori section, and actually writing it off as bad pedagogy or useless. And that, you know, like our previous conversation. Uh, so sort of sees how it, I think it's clear how easy that is when something appears sort of all over the place in different with different codes, apparently because you're misrecognizing what the target is, it's easy to write it off. Um, I'll just talk about this, uh, which goes back to this assignment. And I noticed about that the assignments generally mirrored the sort of triangular tool. This is this is in mainstream, the main, you know, the, I mean the assignments were uh, based in the sort of mainstream part of the course, that generally they took out that they took out the interjection, the interjected move. They took that out and asked students to do it for themselves. And this seemed very significant to me, especially if you're Māori, because it's asking you to do that to yourself. It's asking you to uh, actually be that person who does that interjection who reorganizes someone else's uh, context in a way to, to suit your theory. And that's, that's there's some difficulty in there, uh, which, is, which is important, I think. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just sort of, sort of end here. But there's a number of other things. I'll just talk about this issue of intercultural deafness, which is mentioned in the abstract. And so what I'm getting at there is when uh, an old Māori person is presented with someone who is speaking in this Māori discourse, they can't hear them. And I've seen this in a num play out in a number of ways. Um, just a little connection with neoliberalism there. So if enough students start to not start to get, apparently get very little from the Māori sections and they complain about it, then the Māori course, the Māori section becomes at risk of failing the test of the neoliberal of the market and could be deleted. Let's just put it like that. Or changed in some way to make it more like the mainstream. Um, so I'll just talk about very just literally for a few seconds. I've this intercultural deafness, it plays out in our universities in a couple of ways. One important way is, and is, um, again, hypothesizing that this is involved in why we don't have many Māori academics. Um, so they, they apply for a job. They are interviewed by non-Māori who cannot hear them. Um, and I've been part of panels myself where we've had a string of um, non-Māori applicants and everything seems perfectly clear. The Māori applicant comes and uh, most of the panel can't hear what this person is saying. Um, I can, I have to say, I can hear it. And um, so that Māori applicant uh, is, is at a disadvantage because of this problem. Um, 
And it's the same with Māori's students sort of trying to get into, uh, you know, controlled entry or selected entry to courses. Um, but anyway, I'm going to end there. There's a few other comments, but we've done well for this evening. And I just want to thank everyone, everyone for helping me out with this. Um, thank you. And I've, Thanks, I've gone very Brian. dark. I really, <laughs> uh, you've gone very dark there, yeah. Thanks. Uh, put another shilling in the meter. And uh, thanks, there you go. Thanks, Brian. That was um, really, really interesting. Um, uh, I love seeing this stuff with autonomy. It's really fascinating <laughs> for me. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining in. I, I really do like uh, a more informal and chatty kind of round table like we've had this evening. It's been, um, well, evening my time. It's been um, really great. Um, I know like, I always find this a bit lame, but because you can't really hear us, so, but th there's a, a sort of silent um, thanks from me and um, other people are putting that, their sort of thanks and so on for in the chat as well. Um, um, like Karina says, excellent engaging round table. If you want to have a quick look at that before you go, Brian. Um, uh, but no, that's awesome. And people can get in touch with you. Uh, if they if they want to engage with that or want any more or or want to hear if you publish if you publish any of this stuff, please let us know or at least send it over and if you want, and, uh, happy to give some feedback on it. Yes, I, that's I'm trying to I'm trying to write something. Yeah, well, yeah, and trying to write that's is my uh, trying to write is my default setting in life. Um, <laughs> writing less so, but yeah. So thanks everybody and thanks uh, Brian. Um, for that and i hope to see you in a couple of weeks time we're going to be at 7 p.m just in case um